Welcome back, Earth Dwellers. As ripples move around obstructing objects and bounce off walls and barriers, return signals reveal the existence of these boundaries even if we can't see them directly. When we get an X-ray of our skeleton, we use the bending and reflecting of electromagnetic waves to see the interior of our bodies. So it is with seismic waves, which refract and reflect, bend and bounce, as they travel through the Earth's body. In our last episode, we discussed the body waves and surface waves, and noted that only P body waves and Rayleigh waves could go through fluids. Focusing on the body waves, P waves can go through solids and fluids, but S waves can only go through solids and are blocked by fluids. Any gas or liquid will block the transmission of S waves. There's an additional fact about these waves we will use today. Depending on what kind and density of material the waves are moving through, their velocity can change. Some of these boundaries we will find today affect the velocity of the waves as they cross. In 1909, a Croatian seismologist, Andrija Mohorovicic, noticed that seismic waves arrived in a pattern that only made sense if the P and S waves were bouncing off some kind of a boundary within the Earth. This boundary is called the Mohorovicic discontinuity, or the MOHO, and it marks the base of the Earth's crust. This is what we call a compositional boundary, where aluminum-silica-rich minerals decline and give way to more iron-magnesium-rich varieties with depth. The base of the crust is about 7 to 10 kilometers below the ocean floors, or 30 to 70 kilometers below continental surfaces. Not all of the seismic wave energy bounces off the MOHO, and a portion of both the P and S waves continue into the next layer known as the mantle. The next boundary down that can be detected is not a compositional boundary, like the crust-mantle boundary was, and is mainly detected by a slowing of the S wave velocity. The slowing of shear waves is seen 90 to 110 kilometers below continents and 35 to 120 kilometers below oceans, so this depth can be quite variable. First suggested to exist by A.E.H. Love of the Love Waves in 1911, this is a dynamic boundary, not compositional, meaning the chemistry doesn't change here with depth, but material goes from its more rigid, solid rock state to a more plastically deformable layer. Purely dynamical boundaries have changes in such physical states of the matter without changes in the chemistry. The rigid crust and upper mantle above are the lithosphere, and this boundary defines the base of the lithospheric plates, which are floating on the more deformable asthenosphere, the larger part of the mantle below. Movements of and between these two layers were covered more deeply in the plate tectonics episodes. Continuing down, both P and S waves penetrate the asthenosphere, and whether we count the whole mantle or just the asthenospheric part, it is the layer with the most volume and mass of the Earth. Eventually, in our downward descent, a funny thing happens. We see the P and S waves reflect again, and some of the P waves enter deeper in, but no S waves enter. Recall that S waves can't go through fluids so it looks like something is blocking S waves about 2,885 kilometers deep, almost halfway to the center of the Earth. Something fluid. This Gutenberg discontinuity, as it is also known from its discoverer, is the boundary between the iron-magnesium-silica-rich mantle and the iron-nickel-liquid outer core. So the Gutenberg discontinuity is both a compositional and a dynamic boundary. This electrically conductive fluid is definitely in motion within our planet, as that motion is the cause of our magnetic field. The heavy iron-nickel-rich composition helps to explain the relatively large mass of our planet as well. Of the four interterrestrial planets' combined mass, Earth has a little over 50%, or the Earth has more mass than the other three planets combined, Mercury, Venus, and Mars. Our journey into our massive planet continues, as the P waves have a little more to tell us as they pass through the liquid outer core and hit one more boundary, known as the Lehmann discontinuity, where reflection and refraction and velocity change tell us of another dynamical boundary, not chemical. The very center of our planet is still iron-nickel rich, but is solid to the center. Pressure increases with depth, and about... 
5,155 kilometers deep within our 6,371 kilometer radius Earth, the liquid iron nickel gets compressed back into a solid and stays so to the center. So from the center out, we see the solid iron nickel inner core, the liquid iron nickel outer core, the more plastically mobile asthenosphere portion of the mantle, the upper portion of the mantle making the lower lithosphere, and the rest of the lithosphere up through the crust to the surface where the seismic waves re-emerge to be recorded after their long, tortured journey. And here we are, living on top of this crust, whose thickness is analogous to a band-aid on a basketball. If you shrink the earth down to the size of a basketball, the thick part of the band-aid is like the continental crust, and the thin part is similar to the thickness of ocean crust. In this analogy, the moon would be a tennis ball about 24 feet away. We've traveled to the tennis ball for 24 feet away, but we have never drilled through that band-aid here on earth. It is solely from studying seismic waves that we can see the structure deep within our planet. While we were up on the moon, each mission installed a seismograph to study moonquakes. Because all these seismographs were placed on one side of the moon facing the Earth, we have less total information about the moon's structure, a fact exacerbated by the Congress killing the program over budget concerns in 1977. But... Thanks to NASA crashing the discarded lander after use, we knew exactly the time and energy of those impacts and could get a better picture of what the moon's interior was like. What we do see is enough to tell that the moon has a core, and like our core, it has a solid inner core and a liquid outer core. But this core is smaller than the Earth's, not only in absolute size, but in relative size to the planetary body. Proportionally, the moon has more of its mass in the mantle material. As for the moon's crust, it is thicker on the far side that always faces away from the Earth. The thinner, Earth-facing crust is fractured through with large impact craters filled with basaltic lava flows from impacts and eruptions early in its history. This crustal imbalance means the moon's center of gravity is off-center. And I hear this was a factor in Apollo 11 nearly running out of fuel before its historic landing. The gravity calculations estimated they would have hit the surface a bit sooner had that imbalance not existed. With each landing placing a seismograph to measure earthquakes, I mean moonquakes, a few varieties were found. Impact generated, shallow quakes, and deep quakes. The shallow quakes are mostly thermal adjustments of the crust and upper mantle, and the deep quakes appear to be associated with adjustments at the mantle core boundary, which appears to be semi-molten. These deep quakes are most common up there, with about 7,000 recorded in the eight years of active measurement, and mostly they're weak quakes, occurring with a periodicity of the period of the moon's orbit around the Earth, about 28 days. So they are probably tidally induced as the moon is tugged by the mass of Earth and Sun. Neither of these generating sources releases as much energy as the decent-sized tectonic earthquakes, but the largest moonquakes are the shallows, and their origin is not truly understood yet. Seven of the shallow quakes measured came in over 5.0 on the Richter scale. That is comparable to moderate tectonic earthquakes. But on the moon, we had such small seismic aperture, the term used when all seismographs are on one side of the planet and mostly closely grouped, and short time of recording on the moon. What we need is a global lunar seismic monitoring system with at least a decade record to find out how these largest moonquakes are generated. Though we never measured an impact moonquake larger than our largest earthquakes, we can assume that both the Earth and Moon have had some phenomenally large impact quakes in their past. One of the most significant and concerning differences between earthquakes and moonquakes is their duration. An earthquake may last up to a few minutes, but a moonquake can last for hours. A major reason for this is the lack of water on the moon. Water in rocks on Earth absorbs shock waves and weathers rocks, making them more capable of absorbing earthquake energy. The smaller size of the moon and more uniform surface also play into these long-duration moonquakes. Couple this with the fact that the mysterious shallow moonquakes had seven come in above 5.0, the largest reaching 5.5 on the Richter scale, 
And then there were many, many smaller yet significant shallow quakes of long duration. There were 28 of these surface quakes recorded in a five-year period between 1972 and 1977. If we ever plan to establish a base on the moon, we better be prepared for some rather regular and long-lasting, possibly strong, moonquakes. The only other planetary body we can get direct quake measurements from is Mars. Viking 1 had a seismograph, but it failed to work. Viking 2 also had a seismograph that did work, and transmitted data back to Earth for a year. And in that year, only one event was measured that could be called a Mars quake. There's a planned mission, InSight, which was first going to be launched in 2013, but it now is projected for a 2018 launch, which will place the first seismometers on Mars, and hopefully capture the first Mars quakes significantly into the 2020s. But with all this talk of instruments used to measure quakes and scales to represent them, it seems time to delve into that subject with a bit more detail. Come back next time to learn how to measure and give outputs on Earthquake's destructive power, here on Earth Explorations.